um, what I've decided to do for the next couple of weeks until we, our Christmas Eve service is just to share a couple of um, Christmas messages, um, messages that I think that um, I think you will enjoy. I think the def- mes- a message that I think definitely will minister to you and um, just, again, remind you of really some important things about why this, the birth of our Savior is so important. And so I've titled today's message, A Hope of Christmas. We're going to be at a couple, couple places in our Bibles. The first place we're going to be at is in Luke chapter 1, chapter 2, I mean, and also in Hebrews chapter 8. So if you want to place bookmarkers on those two places of your Bibles, um, you can do that at this very moment. But before I begin um, this morning's message, let's pray and ask the Lord to, to speak to us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Um, we're so thankful that uh, you brought us all here, Lord. Uh, you have given us so much grace, so much mercy and love this entire week, Lord. I just pray that now as we sit at your feet that we will be able to um, continue to be thankful for the hope that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's a hope that is a living hope. It's a hope that doesn't disappoint. And it's a hope that looks forward to what's ahead. We know that your promises are true and that your promises will be fulfilled. We know that this life is rough. Lord, so many storms and so many deserts that we have to go through, Lord, but we know that you're with us, that you're there the entire way. So now we ask you, Lord, that you will fill this room with your spirit, that we will hear from you clearly, that all distractions, everything that wants to keep us from really hearing your word will be removed, Lord. I want to honor you now with our time, with our, all our minds and our hearts. So open up ears, Lord, and open up minds and hearts. Everyone will receive your word, whether they're here or whether they're watching and listening to this message over the Internet. Thank you. Bless this time. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so... I want to begin by talking a little bit about some of the traditions that, you know, are maybe some of you have that we have now as we begin this Christmas, this Christmas season. Now, of all the beautiful traditions of Christmas, few are so ancient in meaning and rich in symbolism as the symbol, as the simple candy cane. Its shape is the crook of the shepherd, one of the two, one of the first, one of the first who came, which is the shepherd. The lively permanent flavor is the regal gift of spice. The white is Jesus' purity. The red, his sacrifice. The narrow stripes are friendship our friendship and the nearness of his love, eternal sweet compassion, a gift of God from above. The candy cane reminds us of all, of just, of all that, of, of just how much God cared. And like his Christmas gift to us, it's meant to be broken and shared. Now, this is just one example of how simple traditions can be so meaningful and how it could just symbolize so many great things and so many great aspects of our faith. Now, just as a friendly reminder, Christmas is only 21 days away, 21 days away. 
and without and with that come many other traditions that are maybe uh, that are personally uh, meaningful to you and also maybe culturally meaningful to a lot of other people. So let me ask you, what traditions do you have as a family that you've either started or were passed on to you? I know as a family, we do certain things around the house. Just yesterday, Robin put up the, the tree, and, and a few weeks ago, she decorated the house, and um, she gets all into the whole decoration thing. Um, she's so great about it. And it's different now, now that the kids are getting older, it's not the same, but, um, you know, even on Christmas morning, we, oh, Christmas, yeah, morning, we have our own traditions. We, we read the story of, of Jesus' birth before we open up our presents and before we do all that. When the boys were living with us, um, each year, every, all the kids would take a turn. Um, but, yeah, this is something that we started ever since the boys were small, and I hope it continues with them as one day they maybe have their own families. But what traditions do you have? Maybe do you go out as a family and do Christmas carols? Do you, you know, you know cut, go out and get a real Christmas tree? Or do you guys go, have a, you know, maybe an artificial one? Do you go out and give food? or I mean, it could be a number of things. But the question is, why are they a tradition? Do they represent something? And does it still have the original meaning? So as we prepare to, again, enter into the Christmas season, many of the things we do are steeped in historical and cultural traditions. Some of them may vary and mix for the better, but depending on where, depending on where you are, some of them might just clash. Now, if you were to stop, though, and really think about some of these customs and traditions, just the general Christmas ones, would you even know why they were started or what they may have represented? Now, another question that ought to be examined is how much these Christmas, Christmas traditions have changed in the past few years or even within the past hundred years. And here's the big one. Have you ever really wondered why we celebrate Christmas when many scholars today believe that really December 25th isn't really the birth date of Jesus? Well, many historians believe, again, depending on who you ask, the first celebration can be traced back to approximately 336 A.D., Known as the Feast of Nativity, the celebration quickly grew and it spread throughout Christendom in those early days. And ever since then, the message of the birth of Christ and the joy that we celebrate has often been mixed in and added to many other traditions of different people in different cultures as they came to know and believe in the gospel, or believe the gospel. Now, don't get, don't get me wrong. I'm not here to bash on traditions, and I don't believe that traditions are bad. But often, they're handed down to us. And like a game of generational telephone, they often change. And I hope you, I hope I, you know what I mean by that telephone game, it starts off with one thing on one end, and by the time it gets to the end of a, you know, a long line, it, something, it means totally something different. But again, generational telephone, it often changes. But regardless, 2,000 years later, Christmas, it does. It makes us look back to that wonderful night and revel in the glory of God's work at the birth 
of his son Jesus. But now this story is in no way an allegorical story, but rather a historical recounting in the gospel. And in the gospel of Luke, we see Luke very carefully lay out the history of Christmas. And because of this story, we partake in the celebration of God taking on flesh and dwelling among man, answering the hope of man that existed since the events of Genesis chapter 3. And so as we approach, as we get into this, our first part of our reading, this Christmas story in Luke, I want us to look at it from the standpoint as as, uh, one that doesn't have a 2,000 years, uh, so one of, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. I want us to look at it from a standpoint as one who doesn't have 2,000 years of hindsight, but to look at it as Luke is telling it. Now, up to this point, the people of God, the Israelites, had been holding on really tightly to a hope. The hope from Genesis chapter 3. If you remember the fall of Adam and Eve, they defied the command of God and became subject, subject to death. And because of their fallen state, they were cast out of the garden with a curse. And since then, we see God has been desi- desiring, has been wanting to restore that relationship with his creation And we, as humans, we waited with hope for the time that he would restore our relationship with him. See, God promised that he will send an heir of the line and throne of David that will rule over all forever and ever. So, Go ahead, if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. Actually, I want you to actually begin, I want to begin read just a little bit in Luke chapter 1. So let's go there now, Luke chapter 1, and I want to share something really short before I get into Luke chapter 2. So in the Gospels, if you the New Testament, you have Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, and after that is John. So it's the third gospel in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And I'm just going to read the first few verses of Luke chapter 1, just to lay down the groundwork of where we're going. Luke chapter 1, verse 1. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just as the, as the original eyewitness and servants of the word handed them down to us, it also seemed good to me, since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first, to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Now, the reason I read this first is that you can see that the audience of this book isn't to Jewish readers, but to a Gentile, to a non-Jewish audience. And this is to give a Gentile, the Gentile a better view and understanding of what has occurred. So with that in mind, if you can turn a page or two, or three, to Luke chapter 2... And I'm going to be reading Luke chapter 2, the first six verses. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered 
each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And I'll just stop there. Again, let me just mention a few things about what we just read. First, we're given some context about some context and some information about two historical figures. By saying in those days, Luke is referring to the time when King Herod was ruling the area. And this King Herod had renovated, he had done many changes there, and he had renovated the temple, the Jewish temple there. He then mentions Caesar Augustus, or as many other people know him, Gaius Octavian, the grandnephew of Julius Caesar. And the second character he mentions is Cranius, who was the governor of Syria. Now, Luke mentions the first registration, indicating that there were others. It was more than just one. See, at the time, registrations were enacted every 14 years. And unlike the kind of census or uh, the ones we have today, in the world, in that world, at that time, they did it every 14 years because it did. It took, literally took years to get all the numbers compiled together. Now, after this, Luke tells us of some tra travel arrangements that had to be made by Joseph and Mary. That they had to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, keep in mind, at the census, and we covered this a little bit in, in Ruth, at the end of Ruth, but the census, this registration was established by man, but it was used by God to fulfill scripture. So now that you have a pretty good idea of what's going on, now let me read to you a separate passage of scripture that reveals the hope that people had at the time. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over since I have rejected him over king over as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected for myself a king from his sons. Now at the time it was assumed, and throughout you know history, it was assumed that this passage was either talking about Solomon or one of Solomon's sons, yet we see that the kingdom had split after the death of Solomon. There was a northern kingdom of Israel, and that fell to the Assyrians in 722 BC, and then the southern kingdom of Judah, that fell in 587 BC to the Babylonians, and they were, they were exiled they were living in exile for 70 years. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us, but the history books do tell us about the rise and fall of the Persians, the Greeks, several other kingdoms and powers that came and went. And now, by the time we are here in our story, the Roman Empire is the mighty power right now, and it's occupied, it's occupying the land. But in spite, of this, in spite of all this, the people still held on to the hope of God's promise that the house of David would last forever. And they were desperately desiring an earthly king. Now, this hope for this earthly king wasn't completely misplaced. They weren't completely wrong. See, they were only partially correct. 
as they were expecting an earthly king, what they forgot was that God was their king. This is the issue that we see in Samuel chapter 8 when Israel demanded a king. They would reject a heavenly king because their focus was upon their current circumstances and their focus was on what they wanted right then at that moment. Now, this, Jesus, him coming, was also the fulfillment of Isaiah 53, that a servant would come to suffer for his people. Now, if you've never read Isaiah 53, I would, I would want you to go home and, or wherever you're at and just open up that chapter in Isaiah and, and read it. And you'll see how it's an amazing fulfillment and story of, tells all about Jesus and how he would suffer for mankind. Now, what's interesting, too, about Isaiah 53, that in Israel today, it's not a part of the public reading of Scripture. It's one of those passages that's completely ignored because it brings up too many questions about, isn't this talking about Jesus? And so they would just rather just ignore those kind of questions and completely skip that when they do their public reading of Isaiah. And so, yeah, it's completely skipped over. Now, at this point, I just want to get to the message of the hope of Christmas. You see, God is sovereign. God is sovereign, and His sovereignty, it does, it gives us hope as believers. It gives us hope as His children. See, hope... Hope is never a blind thing. It doesn't grasp aimlessly into nothingness. No. There's an object of our Christian hope. It's a hope anchored in and centered around a very particular parameters. It should almost go without mention that the Christian hope, that Christian hope has very much to do with Christ. But we can say more about that. I can say more about that. How is it that Christ is the object of our hope as those who strive to follow God? Well, in Romans chapter 8, that's going to be the second part of our reading. In Romans chapter 8, Paul dives into this topic So, again, if you have your Bibles with me, turn to Romans chapter 8 as I read from verses 18 through 30. Romans chapter 8. And there the Word of God says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was, sub- was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as a first fruits, as a first fruits, where we are also grow, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, in the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. 
we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. For those He, for those he foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. His launching point here is creation itself. Now look at what he does. Look again what he does there. Paul doesn't begin a discussion of Christian hope with Christ, and then work backwards to us and to our world. No, he starts with our world and then moves forward in a way that lays the groundwork of hope. It reinforces that Christ has brought hope to us and to our world by himself becoming part of our world. But let's not forget where this whole that this, uh, where this whole discussion in, in Romans chapter 5 through 8 begins. Paul is writing to a group of believers in Rome who are experiencing some tremendous, extreme struggles and suffering. He wants to make sure this presentation of Christian hope doesn't simply gloss over or slide right past the struggles and sufferings of this world. This here is key. And we should take a good lesson from Paul here. The Bible, the Word of God is affirming that our hope can never be in denial of the realities of a sinful and broken world. Christian hope is never meant to be a band-aid that covers over and hides the scars of our broken and fallen world. For certain, any hope that denies the struggle and suffering of a world broken by sin is a hope that is empty and useless. See, because, because uh, unless that hope can reach down and meet us exactly where we are, it offers little comfort. And after all, isn't the point of the gospel to show us that Jesus did, in fact, reach down to meet us exactly where we're at? Now, just to get uh, particular and, and to be more specific, what about the gospel of Christ gives us real and true hope? What about it? Not a disconnected and ineffectual hope that points past our struggling world to some distant afterlife. Basically, what is it about the gospel of Jesus that lands a very real and powerful hope right here, right now, into the lives we are experiencing today? To answer that question, we need to talk about a very particular teaching of Christianity, something we call providence. It is that we understand, it is that we understand to be God's providence that gives our hope an anchor and foundation right here, right now, in this world today. You see, my friends, Nothing is beyond his care and his grasp. Nothing at all. Let me read to you again how, Pi, how Paul applies this in Romans chapter 8, in verses 18 and 23 of what I just read, Romans chapter 8. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's going to be revealed. Verse 19, for the creation eagerly awaits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay 
in the glorious freedom of God's children. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Verse 23, not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first, free, as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Providence then is what grounds our hope in a certain assurance that good or bad, prosperity or struggle, God's redeeming and restoring power to make all things new, to make all things new can never be stopped. God's reach into our broken and shattered world has the power to hold any and every situation and circumstance in a way that keeps our world and our lives on track with his redeeming purposes. My friends, church, no evil is ever too strong to overpower God's plan. Paul says so and later in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. And there he says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from what? From the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what the providence of God looks like as an object of our Christian hope. And as a surely that Christ is the object of our hope, we also see that in, this, that in this passage that there is evidence of our hope. There's something tangible and real about this hope that shows up into our lives. It's a hope that is visible within us and to those around us. Think of it this way. Christian hope is a hope that has action behind it. It, it. it isn't just a hope that we hold on to in our heads and upon our hearts. This is a hope that does something. We act in hope and because of this hope. Now, don't judge me as you know, in some of these tradition, Christmas traditions that we had, but when my kids were younger, they would go to bed on Christmas Eve hoping that there would be presents in their Christmas stockings or under the tree when they woke up the next morning. Now, again, kids are, old, are older now, and I can say these stories now, but, you know, my wife would, you know, stay up all morning um, well, late at not all morning, but just really late wrapping these presents. Um, I would tr there was a time when I tried to help her, but she just wraps them so neat and so nice. And, you know, the kids would know if, like, you know, if I would be wrapping them. And um, she was just really good at it. And whatever she's good at, just, you know, just go ahead and do it. And I'll pass you the tape, you know, and, you know, I'll bring you water, whatever it is. Um, but she does that. But anyways, they went to bed at a certain time knowing that they, when they woke up, there would be presents in their stockings or under the tree. They didn't know necessarily, or they didn't necessarily know when exactly those presents, what those presents would be. But they had uh, a pretty sure solid hope that something would be there in the morning. And because of this hope, they would take some action around it. They would insist on having a small plate of cookies for Santa next to the mantle, next to the fireplace where the, stocking, where the stockings were placed. Each one of even my 22-year-old boy, I remember he would do the same thing. And then, again, she would be rapping, and I'd take a few bites out of the cookies. And, you know, again, I, I would play my role. But... Um, their eager expectation of what was coming 
was solid enough that they would pursue and take on some of these patterns and actions centered around this hope for presence in their stockings and under the tree. It was a hope that showed as something visible in what they were doing because they were so sure they were so sure that they were hoping what they were hoping for was absolutely going to happen. It was the evidence of the hope they have or they had. Look again what Paul says in verses 28 and 29. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You and I, those, everyone who follows Jesus have been predestined by God for what? To be conformed to the image of his son. This is where hope shows up in action. This is what gives evidence to the hope we carry. It is the evidence that you and I are on this journey of discipleship in which we are being molded and shaped and formed more and more into the image or into disciples, into the disciples of Jesus that Jesus called us to be. It's the evidence that our bodies, that our lives gradually move closer and closer to resembling <coughs> and reflecting the image of Christ himself in us. This is a certainty. This is, this is certainly a process that takes a significant amount of hope. So do you see what this passage is saying? We know that in all things, God works for the good, for the good of those who love him. Let me repeat that. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Don't forget, my friends, that the overall tone of these chapters in Romans is a discussion about sufferings and trials and struggles. So that there is a pretty bold statement for Paul to be dropping in the middle of this. Romans 8.28 is one of those verses in the Bible which is often quoted but is also greatly misunderstood and incorrectly applied. See, it's not Paul's intent in this passage to cover over and dismiss the struggles and the sufferings of others. Not at all. Paul isn't trying to take all the evil and brokenness of this world and somehow twist it around and relabel it as something good. There's nothing good about evil. There's nothing good about evil. There's nothing good about suffering. There are good things that may come about, uh, from it, but really there's nothing good about evil. There's nothing good about sin. For, but for those who have fe faced trials, for those of you who have faced trials and setbacks, there's comfort in these words which remind us of a hope that extends to us with such power and force that no amount of evil can break us apart from the loving hand of our God who has saved us and called us and redeemed us to be his very own. I'd like to repeat that but make it more personal to you. For those of you who have faced trials and setbacks, there is comfort in these words which remind you of a hope that extends to you with such power and force 
that no amount of evil can ever break you apart from the loving hand of our God who has saved you and called you and redeemed you to be his very own. The thought of that is, it's just, it's jaw-dropping. It's mind-blowing. Let me get to the point. Christian hope doesn't only show up in the winds, but it also shows up in the losses. Christian hope doesn't only bear evidence in the blessings and the, the prosperity, the good times, but it also bears evidence in the struggles, the trials, the difficulties, the challenges. Christian hope isn't so, fra isn't so fragile and fickle that it shatters apart on the stormy waves of our broken and sinful world, but it remains the constant beam of light illuminating our path forward and guiding our steps. So now, where then does this hope point us toward? What is the direction of our hope? Well, Paul closes this section of Romans 8 by echoing the chain of what we have received and experienced through faith that was first introduced all the way back in Romans chapter 5. Now here in Romans 8 uh, verse 30, he closes it this way. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The hope that we have is a, point, is a, is a hope that points in the direction of glory. It is for this reason that Paul was able to make that statement way back in chapter 5 about taking glory in the sufferings of his friends in Rome. Not because of some kind of vengeful or spiteful person, but because Paul sees a hope that points to glory, that is able to hold secure all who are in Christ Jesus, no matter no matter what trials and struggles may come. Now, let me just quickly mention a quick word about the idea of glory as we read it in the Bible. Glory comes from the Old Testament Hebrew word kavod. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, kavod. It refers to the incomparable majesty of God. It has the same Hebrew root word that means heavy or weighty. This isn't only weighty in the sense of being big and having lots of pounds or weighing a ton. But, some, but sometimes we also use weighty to refer to something that is so insurmountable and so compelling that it forces us to take notice and to act. Have you ever experienced that where you, all of a sudden you come to a certain understanding, you're like, man, that is heavy. That is deep. It goes way beyond the surface level. It goes down deep, deep, deep. It's heavy. It's so heavy that it forces you to take notice and act. See, the kavod, glory of God, is described in this same kind of way. The very presence and existence of God is something that can't be ignored. His power is so compelling that it forces us to take notice and to respond and to act. The kavod glory of God cannot be circumvented or removed or just pushed aside. And this attribute, attribute of God to which, and this is the attribute of God to which our hope as Christian points forward. 
The kavod glory of God is something into which we are grafted by Christ through faith. It holds us and our lives with unshakable power. That's the direction in which our hope moves. As certainty, as certainly as Christ has been glorified by the Father, we too are held insecure in the love of God. We're also being conformed into the image of Christ and are being glorified. Did you know that? Let me repeat that in case you didn't catch it. As certainly as Christ has been glorified by the Father, we too, who are held secure in the love of God, are also being conformed into the image of Christ and are also being glorified. Church, friends, my brother and sister in Christ, we are glorified by God in a way that shows the entire world the hope which keeps our faith secure in His love. So do you see now? I didn't want to make this message completely about Christmas. I'm going to, again, save, save that for our Christmas Eve message. But here today, I wanted to show you the hope of Christmas. The hope that we now have because that child was born over 2,000 years ago. And I hope that that understanding has made now an impact in your lives, that it's caused you to move, it's caused you to do something about it. And if it has, and don't ignore it, God is calling you today, right now, to come to Him. Will you accept that invitation? Jesus Christ died on the cross to set you free. To set you free from the bondage of sin and death. Died to forgive you of all your sins and to restore that relationship that again was broken. In him are all the promises of God. And those promises they will come to fulfillment and they will not disappoint. Eternity is waiting for those, a glorious eternity, because there's a glorious eternal eternity and there's a horrible, terrible eternity. And one of those two is awaiting you, depending on the action you take on what you've already done or what you will do. So for those of you here, those of you watching and listening, I want to give you the, that opportunity right now at this very moment to come to the cross to have your sins forgiven, to be set free from that bondage. So wherever you're at, wherever you may be, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all your heart, with all sincerity, I want you to pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. ask you right now to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died for my sins and rose from the dead. So now at this very moment, I turn from my sins. I repent and confess you as my Lord and Savior. 
thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for saving me. So now, Jesus, I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me and teach me and protect me all the days of my new born-again life. In your name, amen. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.